Hey, welcome to the peanut gallery. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the peanut gallery. Joe, <laughs> welcome. Neighbor Joe. Thank Neighbor you, Joe. Joe Pratt, longtime uh, resident of Elmer. Grew up in uh, the Elmer area for the most part. High school, East Algon. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, I won't give out your specific address, although I'm sure most people who are listening to this will pretty much know your whereabouts of where you live in the town and, yeah. and who you are. No and GPS coordinates. Yeah, they'll, they'll know everything. Yeah, yeah. There'll be drones flying over yeah. the neighborhood yeah. later yeah, on, yeah, yeah. the paparazzi. It's a big deal. Oh, it's, it's a, a big deal. So, Peanut Gallery is huge, yeah, I it's, heard. it's massive. Yeah. So, welcome. Thank you for coming in today. No um, I wanted to uh, invite you in. We've had some conversations the last little while about uh, about health and uh, the different things that you've been facing in your life, specifically speaking, diabetes um, and your journey with, um, uh, with, what, with what that's meant, how you've had to deal with it, when it started in your life, uh, some things, I mean, just talking to you this morning, I didn't I didn't know about your journey. I mean, I mean, being neighbors, I mean, I think we've been across the street from each other for almost five years now and on and off conversations, getting to know each other, mm-hmm. you know, what? who's that weird? guy that just moved across the street from you. Okay. Yeah. He's got multiple kids. So this should be fun to watch. You know, that that's me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm looking across the You're street pretty you, and I'm like, wow. Okay. He's got three kids. Everything's like, seems like it's going really well. All right. Um, what can I watch and learn? What is Joe doing? And that sort of thing. But I want to invite you in and just had a conversation about, you know, growing up in a small town and raising teenagers in, uh, through COVID, but also talk about your experience and your journey with uh, diabetes and how, how that, uh, um, how that's impacted your life and the things that you've had to do to normalize uh, what is a, a difficult situation uh, or can be a difficult situation, how you've been able to mitigate some of that. But uh, maybe can you share a little bit about your your backstory, um, where hey, you guys are from? And- just, just to backtrack real quick, because there's a little bit of confusion. Who is the weird neighbor? Because I think yeah. he was kind of looking at you. You were looking at him. So who, who was yeah, the Yeah, I was a little neighbor? confused there, <laughs> well, too. I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, Patrick, you're pretty entertaining. Yeah, I'm, right. I, I'm pretty sure that yeah. we compete for the prize. <laughs> it, dep- it depends on the moment and yeah. what our kids are up to. But well, no. Just like you invite a guy into the podcast. First thing you do is be like, that is my weird neighbor. So <laughs> well, know, yeah. Everybody's it's, got one, right? This is ours. It's definitely. <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty blessed to have Patrick uh, move in across the street. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, that. You know, but <laughs> Compared to, you know, we'll see how time. He's only been there. Five years, right? So, you know, he's make got, a he's yeah. got time. If I and make and we'll see how the peanut gallery episode goes. <laughs> yeah. To you know, my opinion might change. The voting might be. Uh, I might be out of the street by tomorrow. Who's we'll he? Yeah. No, he's gone. Let's have the committee. I'm like, what committee? I didn't even know there was a committee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate yep. that. Yeah. I'll take. I'll take the yeah. trophy. Everybody knows yeah. I'm awkward anyway. That's just life. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, your your family history, where you guys come from, how you end up at Elmer. You uh, know. Uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Elmer. Uh, my dad uh, worked in Elmer and uh, what did he born do? and raised. Uh, he was a welder. Oh, El- really? Okay. Yeah, Elmer Toolcraft there. So, yeah. So then, uh, yeah, born and raised. Uh, moved to Port Bruce when I was like 13. Uh, spent my teenage years in Port Bruce and then moved back, uh, you know, about 20 to the big town of Elmer. And that's when you moved so in I've across never, the street from where we are now? Pretty much, yeah. There's a few uh, apartments and temporary residence in between, but yeah, pretty much. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, so yeah. family man, uh, married. Yeah. yeah, always had a vision of, uh, you know, having uh, a wife and a kids and, uh, you know, a dog and... You know, yeah, uh, you definitely have, yeah, you know, yeah. a house and a job and a, you know, a car to drive. And that's always what my plan was. So now you have it. it. Married, it. long time to Karen, a couple kids, yeah. well, three, three, two girls and a boy, all teenagers. So you're in that. Well, one is moving on to, is she starting college next year? Is that happening? Is she? Uh, well, you know, she's uh, the oldest is in second year university. Second year uni- wow. Yeah. Already. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it's it? It's like COVID is a completely detached timelines and mm, where right. people are at. Yeah. So you're, you're young. You're, your other daughter must be almost a senior at in high school. Yeah. Now. This is her last year in high school, I think. Wow, that's You're just You're really crazy. testing me as a father. I got to remember all You're this stuff. You're doing well. I'm going to ask I, me well, their birthday no, next. No, no, I'm <laughs> okay. not going there. Don't, yeah, there's no, rules. Yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> rules. There's a, Anniversaries, yeah. birthdays. <laughs> yeah. How long has this been going on? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember. We it speak anyways. in general. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's <that's good. laughs> very important. <laughs> I just, I, I've heard COVID uses a lot of excuses, but Patrick throwing it out for timelines now. Yeah. Like he completely missed out on something your children were doing. He's like COVID. Yeah, yeah. I would have known if it weren't for COVID. Yeah. So it's good. It's good. COVID for everything. It's a fault. 
all do. Well, it, Definitely. It's markers because you don't have the same graduation stuff. You don't have the same, like, it's not as visible as what, you know, things were in the past. It's not as... No. No, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah markers yeah. between first and second year university. You could, well, you could be, right? Yeah, uh, like, uh, they're not moving out. They're not, uh, you know, they're just rammed Thank in you, their Joe. basement. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. yeah. See? Albert, just leave, leave poor Patrick alone. Thank just you. Doing just fine. Wow, unbelievable. I can't See, believe I got that. your back, neighbor. I'm, I'm, That's I'm what get, neighbors do. You, and you can tell we've, we've, this is why we've called it the peanut gallery. Right here is a perfect moment of why this is called the peanut gallery. They're in the gallery and they're the peanuts. <laughs> Keep it up and there'll be peanut butter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I, I, we were having a conversation a few weeks ago and um, I, I've always noticed you have a little device attached to you everywhere you go. Yeah. Insulin pump. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, so what's, what's the deal? So we started that conversation, but I want to, I want to go back a little bit and, and, and kind of look at, um, you know, your history with, with diabetes sure. and maybe I, I always assumed, and up until this morning when we were having a conversation, I, I'm like, okay, so you've been dealing with this your whole life. And yeah. you're like, no. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> like bring but, me up to speed. Right. Obviously your first, your first interaction with diabetes was, wasn't, wasn't yourself. Maybe you could share a little yeah, bit about it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what everyone assumes. Uh, you know, you said, oh, you know, you had diabetes your whole life and you've just managed to do all these great things. And a lot of diabetics do do that. But uh, I, I grew up with the disease a little bit differently because uh, my brother had it first and he was an older brother. So I got to see both sides of that disease, right? I got to see him from the outside looking in. And then, you know, on my 30th birthday, I was diagnosed with with type one as well. So, so happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday. That's wild. So like from your yeah. brother's perspective, okay, here, here he is. He's five, right? That's what yeah. you're saying. Around five years old, yeah. diagnosed with diabetes. And I mean, we're talking at this point, many, many moons ago, like four decades ago, roughly something like that. Correct. A long time ago. Uh, so how people treated uh, diabetes, how things were approached, how, how, how doctors in the medical community tried to make this a livable disease for people. Yeah. Maybe you were, you were sharing a little bit about what it was like for him. So yeah. he's got diabetes. Obviously yeah. he's, he's insulin dependent. So he needs to have insulin as part of his, yeah. his daily, daily life to balance out his blood sugars to, cause if you get too high, or you get too low, you you can die. Right. Um, you, if uh, I think it's, is it too low is more of the, the worry for that, but maybe you can explain uh, a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, the technology has really changed. So I'll get into that, you know, how you manage, uh, how that diabetes works. Basically what diabetes is, is, uh, uh, lack of insulin in your body. So, uh, you know, every um, science presentation I ever had to do in school was on Frederick Banting, right? Because that's all I, you know, that was, it was just everything in our lives, right? right. So uh, what diabetes is, is, uh, you know, Frederick Banting discovered that uh, there's a lack of insulin. So what happens is when you eat your food, your food, uh, uh, the sugars from the food get absorbed and into your bloodstream through your stomach and intestines. And then it uh, floats around in your blood uh, and your muscles and your brain and your lungs and your heart all need that uh, sugar. And the uh, liquid or the device that takes the sugar from the blood into your muscles is insulin. Okay, so the insulin acts as like the, the, the transfer, transfer liquid. Oh, that's this right. is how we're going to get sugar from blood into the part of the body at that time that, that needs, needs it. it. So when that's not happening. Right. So when that's not happening, your body is, your blood sugar is building up. So, you know. What I, happens when blood sugar goes uh, too high? Like what are goes some of the. To, yeah, long term, it'll kill you. <laughs> It'll make you, you'll, you know, do nerve damage, uh, you know, short term, it makes you lethargic. It makes you thirsty. It makes you tired because your body, your muscles, your brain, is not getting the energy that it needs. It'll dehydrate you. Uh, you'll frequently urine, you know, like pee a lot. Right. Uh, and uh, that's a sign of high blood sugar. Wow. So you, you, you could literally 40 years ago yeah. on a hot day. Just be thirsty because it's a hot day, but it could be the fact that your sugars are too high and the insulin that was prescribed to you by your doctor is not sufficient to transfer 
the sugar that your body is requiring at that moment. So instead of getting dehydrated from the heat, you're actually dehydrated from – that'd be a hard thing as a five-year-old. Like as a kid, your right. parents trying to figure out, here, drink some more, drink some more. Oh, now right. he's peeing a lot. Oh, right. he, well, okay, he needs – like does he need more insulin? But like he's he's drinking lots. He's going to the washroom a lot. What, what yeah. It'd be confusing. Like it'd be right. really hard to register as a, as a parent. Like I'm yeah. – like, I think about my kids. I got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I'm like – you know, uh, how they eat, how they sleep, how they poop, it all matters. Right. And, like, you're, you're observing that kind of stuff from the point of view of, like, you care about your kid. That right. must have been a little bit hard as parents to look at your five-year-old kid and be like— and Figure out what's going on. It's, and it's you not hear like it we, all the time. It happens, you know, it happens all the time, right? Uh, I'm sure even today, you know, someone, you know, their kid's sick. They can't figure it out. They keep going back and forth to the doctors, doctors, and then, you know, they figure out it's type 1 diabetes. The thing with it is we're accommodating. We are a species of, uh, you know, uh, it creeps up on you slowly. It doesn't happen like uh, a car accident where it's like, bam, it's done, right? Your beta cells that create the insulin are slowly dying off. And then you end up getting this disease over, you know, a three month period. So within that three months, you know, you're adjusting your lifestyle. Oh, he's just always tired or, oh, he's just not feeling well. Hmm. Or, oh, you know, you're just thirsty because, you know, you got, it's dry outside or like you said, right, dehydrated, whatever. So, you know, as people were just very uh, accommodating. Right, because uh, we're not thinking it's right. like the that, worst, right? right? We're thinking, ah, oh, it's just a, even a growth spurt, or it's like it, right. there's a whole bunch of different answers that you would come to. And then to find out as parents that it's it's type 1 diabetes, it's right. almost kind of like, like, oh, man, like, right. I missed that. Like, yeah. Not that you're expecting it, but even as a parent, you're going to own it in a sense, and you're going to be like, man, yeah. come on. So you're a few years younger than your brother. Yeah. So – now, for the next 25 years, you you had to watch him deal with diabetes and the different impacts right. that it had on his life. So, it had an impact on all our lives, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, like he, uh, you know, the technology's changed. We'll probably get into that later with the technology changing. And But, you know, when he was younger, uh, the control... Uh, with the uh, blood sugar levels, you know, adding the proper amounts of insulin uh, was kind of, uh, you know, uh, very um, rough. Yeah, you were saying, okay, so very, they would, every yeah. every quarter yeah. of a year, you would take like a blood sample to right. your doctor. Yes. So like every three months, you're taking a sample. They're going to read the sample. And from that one sample and that one flashpoint in your life, like you have no record of diet, you don't know how things are, like you're trying to be a certain way, but he's going to determine from that one sample the next three months of insulin supply. That's right. Where diabetes is one of these, it's one of the very few diseases where the patient prescribes the amount of insulin. Yeah. So every meal I eat currently, I prescribe myself a given amount of insulin. It's a ratio, right? It's like mixing gas in your weed whacker, right? It's like, uh, you know, it's a five to one ratio or a 50 to one ratio. I mean, not to cut you off, but that's why I have a a battery powered weed whacker. (laughs) Yeah, because you can't do that. That would be like, uh, I'm going to call Joe. (laughs) I need to know what I need to do here. A good diabetic will be able to do the math, right? And it's all ratios. It's all uh, carb counting and ratios is what it is turned into. But yeah, going back to my brother, you know, uh, the doctor would prescribe that uh, every three months and then, uh, you know, give you some guidelines. But, uh, you know, like I remember uh, for the longest time, he would have uh, too much insulin in him, which will then cause a reaction. Uh, So your blood is actually too low on sugar and your body and your brain are looking for more and more sugar because it used it all up. And, uh, you know, he would go, you eventually go into convulsions, which are very scary episodes. Um, but, you know, to me, uh, that is showing me that uh, a diabetic is actually trying to control themselves when they do have those episodes. That means they actually took their medicine. Right. That actually means that a lot of people say, oh, that person's got bad control and they're not, they're not managing the disease well. No, that just means that they made a mistake and yeah. they took too much insulin. They were trying. They were so trying. Like, you have these episodes, the convulsions yeah. are happening. Yeah. Things are like, I mean, yeah. as a kid, you've seen this happen. I'm Maybe sure that you can times. remember 
in your head what it was like. So yeah, like my mother used to, I was a younger brother, but my job uh, was the alarm clock. So I would have to sleep with my brother and then he would go into convulsions. In his sleep. In his sleep and he would start kicking. And then I would have to go get my mother and then they would administer him, you know, uh, uh, sugar. So orange juice, honey, Coke, whatever. Honey, <laughs> sugar, uh, mostly orange juice or honey uh, at the time, but, uh, you know, nothing hard because, you know, you're convulsing, right? right. Like it's like an epileptic seizure. So you try you to know? get it in there yeah. so it starts absorbing Yeah. as the person's convulsing. Right. Wow. And then, it's got to be yeah. a scene that just is hard to watch. Right. And then, you know, there used to be in real extreme cases, there's um, glucose uh, needles that you could actually inject uh, sugar into the person, right? Really? If it was real bad. That's why I, I know, remember being around a diabetic and his go-to when he started to feel like it was coming on, their go-to was always Coke. Right. That's what they, I mean, it was just because it's laced with sugar. Right. And something that they had in the house type thing. But right. so, I remember being in, I remember being in public school. Uh, this is like, and my really, I think my first memory of someone who was a diabetic. I remember uh, one of my classmates. Uh, I think, yeah, they they weren't always in public school because you always remember your class as you go. But I think they joined at like grade five or six into our group of of, of class. And I remember one summer uh, coming back to school in the fall, and he literally had lost like fifty or sixty pounds of body weight, mm. and he went from being like this bigger guy to being a very like thin guy. Mm-hmm. And like, what happened? Like asking that question, and he, you know, oh, I, I got diabetes, and it was just like, <clears throat> okay. And then, like, he would always be going to check his sugar and all this yeah. kind of stuff and getting pricked. And, like, you're watching him do it. And you're kind of like, as a kid, you're like, you don't even know what's going on because yeah. you haven't had that exposure. Right. And that yeah. looks like a big pain in the butt, right? Yeah. It's you're a like, time consuming. Yeah, constantly jabbing yourself. Yeah. His hands were all beat up from pricking yeah. his fingers yeah. and yeah. just like, just crazy. So, if we jump ahead just a little bit, all right. Sure. So, you've been, you've been married couple kids, you've been watching your brother deal with this his whole life. Yeah. Uh, and because it's it's a difficult thing to manage, at least it was for the first, and I'm sure in different countries and different regions, it still is today. Yeah. Uh, but you were watching him for a couple of decades deal with it. You get to be, uh, you know, around 27 and it's, it's starting to look like your brother is going to need to have major surgery right. if he's going to be able to continue living. What, yeah. what, so what his was kid, that? Yeah, so like uh, basically diabetes, uh, like I uh, explained, uh, uh, diabetes is like your life is a string. And insulin is basically kind of a temporary solution. You can make it last your entire life, but over time you need more and more and more and more. So... Uh, your life is a string and the more highs and lows you have, uh, the shorter that uh, time frame becomes. And, you know, because uh, he grew up with, uh, you know, the poor technology, he was an older diabetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was young. So he went through all those rough teenage years, uh, right? Not managing it well. And uh, so more fluctuations. More, more fluctuations. Which means and shorter strain. Exactly. And diabetes has a memory. Right. It doesn't matter that you just straightened your act up right now. It matters that, uh, you know, he had, uh, it has a memory. It won't forget that, you know, when you were 15 years old, you didn't take your insulin for two days. So you start watching your brother and he starts. So he starts, you know, renal failure, uh, you know, needing uh, new kidneys. Um, So what he ended up doing, uh, he ended up going on all three types of dialysis. And the final one is like a a one with a uh, coming right out of your heart. Uh, It's like a tube that comes right off your heart. Uh, But he had like a stint put in his arm. Uh, And if you take a a ballpoint pen, uh, the end of it, it was like a a needle about that diameter. He used to have to shove it in his arm every day, uh, self-administered. So like the guy is tough as nails, right? Like just to mentally have to do these types of dialysis treatments are just, you know, you have to be mentally strong. Well, you got to stick with it, right? Because oh. at some point, the pain and everything is going to overwhelm. Uh, yeah, you the, need to do it. Yeah. Like you need to. Uh, yeah, or the yeah. result. The other. The other side of it is you no longer need to do it because you, <laughs> you're gone. Right. right. You just. 
Okay, so you're so, watching him do this. So, yeah, that, so, so then, then what happens? He's obviously kidney failure. Yeah, he was uh, waiting. I was on a transplant list uh, waiting for kidneys, uh, but he was waiting for both kidney and pancreas. So he wanted uh, both uh, organs. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had uh, a couple of dry runs uh, where, you know, the uh, they call them condovers, you know, the, the organs come in and they turn different, uh, like they turn bad. So they couldn't put them in them. Uh, but he finally, uh, you know, uh, about uh, two years into that, that's when I was diagnosed. And so he and I were diabetics for about uh, two years together. Uh, and then, uh, you know, he finally did have his kidney pancreas transplant. So you're, basically, you're on your, thir- almost on your 30th birthday, like you said, you, yeah. and you get diagnosed on your 30th. Thir- yeah. He's, he's 32. Yeah. He's on the doorstep of, uh, of death. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And now you get diagnosed with the exact same condition <laughs> right. that you've watched him deal with since five. Right. What was that like for you mentally? Uh, I knew what to do and I wasn't going to let anybody, uh, steer me the wrong way. Right. So I knew I saw him, my brother, you know, transition into ownership of his disease. And I quickly took that on. You know, I read every book about the disease. I wanted to be the best at it. And so that I could avoid my brother's situation at all costs. Right. Because you were at the time. Your wife was pregnant with number three, right? Uh, just born. Just Miles born. was just born. Uh, Miles was about two months old. So now you got three little ones. Three little kids. <clears throat> we thought, you know, my job thought, uh, I was tired because of my family life. Right. My family life thought I was tired from my job and here I was just tired. Yeah, your, beta, your beta cells were <laughs> they were failing and dying and, and we were accommodating and I was just sleeping all the time you know I'd pull over on the side of the road going to work and fall asleep you know I'd get to the parking lot at work and fall asleep in the car wake up an hour later then you know go into work uh, you know I'd stop at every Tim Hortons along the way and okay. pick up a drink and and uh, go to the washroom and get more fluid in me uh, it was it, you know looking back on it Outside looking in, it was like obvious. Right. But again, we're accommodating people, right? We just morph into these new habits. Uh, and uh, that's... Uh, the human so resiliency is pretty amazing, oh, right? it's amazing. Like you are right? literally slowly dying and yeah. yet you are figuring out a way to continue to live like right. you need to, to do the things you need to do. Right. Keep not working. realizing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So 30th birthday, um, hey, you got diabetes. Like, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it was a good Friday. Uh, I met this uh, endocrinologist. She came in from her Easter dinner uh, and met me. Uh, her name was uh, Terry Paul. She so it was literally good Friday. Be- yeah. <laughs> beautiful. Way. It was Easter Sunday when she and, uh, you know, she uh, took me and, uh, you know, uh, her and I developed a great relationship over, you know, the next. Uh, 10 years or whatever. Uh, she just recently retired, but, uh, you know, she kept me, uh, she knew my brother. She knew uh, the struggles he was having. She knew that uh, his pancreas tr- kidney transplant went well. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that uh, she knew what I saw, right? And a lot of diabetics don't get to see that. <clears throat> my parents used to try to take my brother and show them, you know, a dying diabetic in a hospital and they would be full of regret. No, oh, I wish I, I wish I uh, had treated it better and, you know, this type of thing. And it's too late and young man, you straighten up. But that five minute visit didn't do anything to my brother. Right. right. It didn't change anything. It might have. It maybe put a pause in him for, you know, a couple of days, a couple a week days, or two. you know, yeah. like with anybody, yeah. you know, you just yeah. preach at somebody just a little bit. And then, it, but for me, I saw it long term. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, I just said, I'll never let that happen to me. So your brother gets a transplant. Yep. His life revolutionized from the transplant. Correct. I mean, outside of having to take anti-rejection drugs and yep. stuff like that, but no longer dealing with uh, insulin dependence and healthy he- healthy man today. Correct. Which is like crazy when you it's think a, about... Oh, it's amazing. It's just a miracle that you can 
You can yeah. do that. Anti the uh, anti rejection drugs are really what uh, made that happen. Right. Right. I guess I, the history of anti rejection drugs is, uh, you know, it's fairly new, and uh, it was amazing to see all the uh, people waiting for pieces of uh, or of organs from these uh, cadavers. Yeah. Uh, you know, the hope in their eyes, like a guy looking for a liver. Uh, I think I forget all that. So different. basically they bring it all to the hospital and there's like a yeah, different teams that are waiting to do surgeries to yeah, do transplants. I remember sitting in a room with like, I think there were seven people, Patrick. Wow. It was amazing. All in their beds. All, you know, like my brother was on his deathbed for like uh, two years, right? So he was like a bag of bones, you know, 80 pounds six foot one, 80 pound, you know, just a bag of bones. Right. And, uh, lots of people looking like that with lots of hope. Right. And so that anti-rejection drugs really, you know, uh, makes a difference. Right. It's just amazing. Yeah. So now, you know, he still has to take them. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, uh, but he's alive. He's alive and, and he's doing well. He's working, he's enjoying his life. Does a lot of fishing. You that's know. amazing. Yeah. It's cool. you know so, can, can I pause one thing? That sure. Just, so with the whole medical system right now, especially with COVID, so many people are like the, you know, pharmaceutical companies, big companies, and there's so much trash about that. And then you hear stories like this, how much modern medicine has done. I think people forget that. I think when you're in the situation you're in, you view this and you go like, this is incredible. Yeah. And over the last year to hear so much slamming against the medical professional, I really think that we need to take a step back yeah. and hear stories like this and be reminded that we can pull this off because there was a scientist somewhere, likely from some big tech, who figured this out. Yeah, they're making money off of it, but they saved your brother's life and they're saving thousands of lives like that. And I just, I think sometimes we forget that. We get caught up in those, those uh, I don't even know what you call them. Details, their flaws. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then that becomes the big story. But when you look at what we've been able to do with medicine, just incredible. Like I, I'm just blown away right. sitting here listening to the story, like just reminded of how incredible we, or how far we have come. Right. So I asked, I asked you the other day, we, we were talking on the lame way, you know, awkward Patrick being the neighbor that, you know, yeah, I, and yeah. I'm just like, Hey, bring so, me to tears. Sometimes, yeah. yeah you know? I'm like, Hey, <laughs> what, what's the deal with the, what's the deal with the thing on your, on your hip? And right. that's when we really started talking about some of the, some of the stuff that you've gone through. So yeah. you're, you're in your journey of diabetes. You're, you figured it out. I'm sure you're doing all your math and calculations, but yeah. then one day, all of a sudden, you get a phone call. Is it from this doctor that yes, you were connected yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, So Dr. Paul, uh, you know, she's part of uh, Lawson's Research Center or Lawson's Diabetes, which is a, a research-based kind of uh, medical industry. And uh, so, so part she's of big, my, big pharma, yeah, part of big she tech. Saw, yeah. She saw how well I was doing managing the disease, right? And she's obviously helping me along. But she also saw that I was, you know, really serious about it. And uh, so, you know, studies come up. Uh, you know, new technologies. <clears throat> so there's this, um, uh, uh, one of the studies, it was the biggest study I was involved in. Uh, it was a three-part study and it was looking at using uh, a thing called a, G or a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, measures your electrical resistance of your body fat, if you want to get into all the technical stuff. <laughs> wow, man. But, which, is, <laughs> which is equally proportionate to your blood sugar. Okay. okay? So uh, <clears throat> you calibrate this thing. But it was looking at using that CGM reading uh, to uh, either give you insulin or stop delivering insulin automatically and make almost an artificial pancreas. So they call it the, a closed loop system. Okay. <clears throat> so I got involved in that uh, study. And there was all kinds of different uh, uh, things you had to do to qualify See, for. You've got a, you had a, you had the thing attached to you. You yeah, had. Yeah. Um, did you already have the IV that was like set up in like they, yeah, they set you so, all up? And then you had computer or something in your basement, yeah, right. dude in Florida. Yeah. Like, so yeah. So getting to you know the uh, technology is basically algorithms. Okay. And uh, there was a fella. Uh, you know, yeah. He had I had a laptop I was hooked up to, and every night. Uh, 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 he would take over the control of my diabetes. And so he would add the insulin and take it away based off of the readings from my uh, CGM. 
And uh, yeah, so it was pretty cool. Uh, he did it for three months. And uh, as a grown man, I never looked much forward to bedtime. I'd be like, yes, I'm going to let the little troll from Florida <laughs> control my blood sugars. Yeah. And I absolutely <clears throat> loved it. One, it took the burden of uh, control off of me because that's one thing a diabetic has to do continuously is it's always on the back of your mind. Where's my blood sugar at? Where am I heading? You know, you, it's constant. Yeah, so you, when you right now in your pocket right now, you yeah. have uh, a little, a little, a little pack of of glucose. That's right. So just in case, just in case, just so you're in armed, case you're, I you're did ready. the math wrong this morning when I ate my breakfast. So long and, before we all had to be concerned about going out with our masks, right? And having like you know, or when I right mm. now during COVID, I got to plan my trips around. Is there a washroom available because everybody shut down? Mm. You always had to have glucose pills in your pocket, and right. you were always making sure that you were. On guard. That's a that's yeah. a lot of added overhead weight. That's right. So now you got you the troll in Florida. The troll in Florida, and you don't realize that weight until the troll in Florida exists. Mm. And he was taking control for me. Uh, and I built a very. I'd never met the man. I don't. I don't. He could have been a woman. It could have been a team of. Who knows? I don't even know who they were, but through the internet, they were controlling it through this laptop. So very cool technology. And then uh, you know, uh, it was like took about a year and a half uh, to develop the technology. So for three months, you were living the dream. Living the dream. Then I had to give that laptop back. Oh, and man. that was painful. I bet. Because now all <laughs> right? of a sudden you realize. I knew that it was existing. Yeah. There's and like this freedom that's there, but now it's you're going to have to hand it over. Right. Oh, man. So then uh, the Medtronics, which is the insulin pump company uh, uh, that developed the technology, uh, then uh, uh, took, I think, a year and a half for Canada to... Um, uh, approve it through wow. Health Canada. And so that whole time I'm just itching to get it. Right. So I'd call like every four months to the Medtronics people like, Hey, where are we at? Like, I want this thing now, you know? So as soon as I got it, then I started wearing the technology and it, to me, it was life changing, right? Like, uh, sleeping better at night, you know, uh, my sugar level was at night when I sleep uh, mostly it's flatlined. Right. Right? So your string has My very string. little up and down. Exactly. So now. so now the end point is right. f- that much further away. And, you know, I feel better. I'm more energetic. Well, right? I've noticed being you your neighbor, <laughs> you, you, you never yeah. stop. Yeah, yeah. You're well, always like, I just got one more thing to do. One more thing to yeah. do. That's like I your know, motto. I know it's 930 at night, but <laughs> I got one, one more thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the trailer's hooked up. We're going to do something. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty cool. So you've been on you've been on the pump for how many years now? Uh, well, I'm 44, so I've been uh, about 13 years on the pump. So they start you off with needles first, just to teach you the basics, right? And uh, I think it's a little bit of uh, encouragement to uh, realize how good the pump is, right? Right. So uh, they don't just dump the best of the best on you and expect you to succeed. Yeah, there's a it's a huge learning curve, uh, you know, for uh, diabetics. So now right? you're saying your blood sugar literally is like monitored every five minutes it's like yeah so the cgm uh takes it uh it, 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 it it's reading it continuously but the insulin pump actually takes the reading every five minutes and adjusts and, and adjusts the uh amount of dose uh so it'll give me like a little bit of insulin if my if it realizes my sugars are going high because i don't have enough insulin in my body and the blood the sugar is building built up in my blood it'll just give me a little dose and then if it sees me dropping uh too low or too quickly low it'll stop those little micro boluses wow so yeah. where we started uh, with your brother when he was five was once every three months right where one, we're mo- at one snapshot moment in time where we're at today is every five minutes right Wow. It's amazing. Technology is amazing. That's just wild. Yeah. You think about how far that's come and the commitment that's been made by people to improve humanity and improve human existence and your life. Like, I mean, exactly. The quality of life, you know, like now people. your kids get to enjoy their dad being the version of their dad that he was meant to be. 
correct? That's yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it, Patrick. That's really cool. And yeah. I get to enjoy watching because it is yeah. endlessly entertaining as your neighbor. <laughs> I never know if there's going to be another boat, another sea do, a trailer, a cement mixer. Yeah. I just don't know what project's going to happen next. It's a lot of fun to yeah. live across the street from you. I want to say thank you for being such a good neighbor to me. You always are willing to offer advice. And uh, I come over and ask you a bunch of questions because yeah. I just don't know. And I know you do because I watch you do the stuff that you do with yeah. your family. So. It's uh, right back at you, Patrick, man. You're uh, a great neighbor yourself, right? Uh, uh, thank you for coming in. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm going to cut you off before I cry. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, thanks for joining us today. We look forward to uh, seeing you at the next episode. Like, subscribe, post, share. What, are, what else do you do in a small town? Go to Tim Hortons and tell somebody about <laughs> the peanut calorie. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thanks a lot, Joe. Appreciate hey, you coming in. Yeah, no problem. It was a pleasure.